I'm a professional nerd. <laughs> it's kind of cool and hip to say that now. But it wasn't always that way. When I was a young man in high school, it was quite the opposite. And you can all trust me on this. I've personally done that research. I, uh, I draw pictures of monsters and dragons and make up fantasy adventures all day. It's what I do. People that are actively pursuing a dream today are rather abnormal. And that being said, I'd like to invite everyone to join me in becoming an abnormal, freakish, outlandish weirdo. <laughs> Imagine, if you will, a small western Maine town surrounded by a mill, or based on a mill, <clears throat> and it's the 80s. And every sitcom has a time-traveling scenario where inevitably someone has to say, who's the president? And they'll have to come back with Ronald Reagan, the actor. Yeah, we use that joke more than where's the beef in the 80s, and it was funny every single time. A young boy is called into the guidance counselor's office, and his grades are in the dumps in this mill town in the 80s. She sits him down, and she says, what are you going to do when you leave here? What kind of work do you think you're going to have? His eyes light up. No one had ever asked him this question before, or if they had, it didn't register that he had a response. He reaches into his backpack, and he pulls out the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Monster Manual 2 by Gary Gygax. It inspired him to draw monsters and creatures all over his notebooks and clothes and everything. Um, it's had this beautiful piece of artwork on the front by this fellow Jeff Easley. It's a giant in a forest lifting up a halberd against a hero on his quest, defying all the odds. He says, I want to do this. I want to draw these monsters. I want to make adventures. I want to be good enough to work for this Gygax guy. That's what I want to do. He was pretty passionate about his response. And she laughed. She furrowed her brow a little bit, kind of concerned, and she said, well, you know, they'll always be the mill. Have you considered getting a job at the mill? In that offhanded comment, she created a gap for that kid. She put up an impenetrable wall on the path of a dream that would stay in place for many years to come. Whatever she said after that doesn't even matter. It became clear to the, to the kid at that point that they were generating kids that were smart enough just to run the machines, figuratively and literally. And who is this kid anyway to think that he could do something so great as to be published around the globe, work making games for this guy gags guy with this big company somewhere? We're a society of hypocrites, aren't we? We give kids crayons and paints and tell them stories about princesses and castles, and we say, here, take this and dream. You can be anything you want. You can do anything in this world that you can imagine. And then when they get a little older, and they come to us, and they tell us that they want to be artists, writers, actors, we shut them right down. We shut them down immediately. We start measuring their value by how much money we think they can make, how many credit cards we think they can have. They can have as many as they want, but as long as it's less than we have ourselves. Why are we surprised when people enter the workforce and they're not inspired to become middle management office cubicle workers or factory line workers? Why are we surprised that depression runs rampant through the, through the workplace when we've been telling people in their formative years they can do anything they want? Why don't we just start out by saying, you know what, you don't need those crayons, you don't need those paints, you don't need those stories. You're going to grow up and get a job assembling cereal boxes in the warehouse. And then later, you'll supervise other people assembling cereal boxes in the warehouse. And then many years later, you'll die face down on the company warehouse floor, alone, empty. And they'll get your name wrong on the sympathy card that they send to your family and they'll replace you the next day. <laughs> if we can't accept that people are destined for greatness, why set them up in the first place? I mean, what, what, is, what is wrong with us? Uh, we, we further confuse this issue by holding up people who play sports, movie actors, and Snooky as heroes. <laughs> what is wrong with us? Can we not accept that someone we know personally, or our parents too, are destined for greatness? Or is it that we're afraid that someone we know intimately is destined for greatness and is not us. 
Not that Snooki is my example of greatness, but I'm sure her dreams are wonderful. <laughs> uh, Thomas Edison discovered a thousand materials that weren't viable as a light bulb filament. These types of gaps or failures are how we learn our craft. They're not barriers to a dream at all for people who are actively pursuing a dream. This year, I myself realized that uh, my knowledge of artistic anatomy was a bit lacking, so I take a piece of that, I work on it a day, I, I expand my knowledge, I learn a little more. That's the work that goes into achieving a goal. That's not the barrier to a dream. It's the emotional barriers to a dream that people put in, in place, people, community, um, that, that these are the gaps that we need to pay attention to. These gaps of discouragement. And we especially need to pay attention to these gaps of discouragement when we ourselves are the ones creating them for others. When I was 40, I decided that I was going to come back here to SMCC. And my real job was sort of falling apart. I remember telling my coworker what I was going to do. What do you think the first thing I heard was? Well, she knew someone who knew someone who got a degree, and they ended up working at McDonald's, flipping burgers. But now they were tens of thousands of dollars in debt. I heard that story a lot. I heard that story. It was the why bother story. I heard that story so many times that I started asking for names. Well, who told you that? Who told them that? I wanted to find this dude with a PhD flipping burgers and ask him what went wrong. <laughs> you know? Amazing. I heard it so many times. Hey, well, anyway, it, you may all be a little relieved to know that I never found Dr. Burger Flipper. <laughs> so I don't know if he exists. <laughs> There's an ugly, competitive, jealous monster that's created when one person tells another person a dream. I think if we can identify that creature within ourselves, we can tell it to shut the hell up. We can kick it, we can invert it. I sincerely believe that we can teach ourselves to have a knee-jerk reaction of positivity, support, and encouragement for another person's dream instead of creating disparaging gaps. My daughter, Raven, is a young, beautiful woman, big eyes. Uh, when she, at one point, when she was younger, she came to me and she told me that she wanted to be a professional cosplay actor. For those that don't know, a cosplay actor is someone who dresses up in costume, and usually it's anime, sci-fi, fantasy, and they go to conventions. I mean, what kind of a job is that? <laughs> that was almost my response. Who am I to judge another person's dream that way? I draw pictures of dragons and make D&D adventures for crying out loud. I, in fact, even know actors who get paid to dress up and go to conventions. Why am I willing to accept that in other people, but not my own daughter? I nearly created a gap for one of the most important people in my life. We, it's possible that we can have it in our hand at any moment, an opportunity to crush a dream and put up a barrier. Or we can become the person that gets out of the way gets behind that person and cheers them on to greatness. When the opportunity arises, we need to consciously make the decision of which one of those people we want to be. <clears throat> Why is it so ridiculous to think that someone can be a cosplay actor, an artist, right, a rapper? When, when those jobs really do exist, and when people get them, we elevate them to be stars. When the lottery hit a billion dollars, who bought a ticket? I did. Uh, when you bought that ticket, were you saying, there's absolutely no way I'm going to win this lottery? <laughs> <laughs> or were you talking about all the great things you do that billion dollars? <laughs> oh, you wouldn't buy the ticket if you had no chance of winning anyway. There's three million working artists in the United States alone, and that doesn't count all the other creative fields, designers, etc. Three million working artists in the United States alone. Who's, unmore, who's more unrealistic? The artist who wants to practice a craft, hone a skill, and enter a creative career? Or us when we're sitting here holding our lottery ticket? You know, pretend you're holding that lottery ticket, you know? The numbers are about to come up, we're watching TV, like, oh yeah. It's my lucky numbers, I picked these myself. <laughs> They're coming up, the numbers aren't drawn yet, you know? Someone reaches over, pops a ticket out of your hand, rips it up, throws it on the floor. 
sit with that feeling for a second. How does that feel? You paid a couple bucks for a dream. Someone just ripped it up and threw it away. When someone tells you a dream, just accept it as it is. You don't need to fix it. Often when I tell people that I'm an illustrator, one of the first things I inevitably hear is, an illustrator, oh, you should do children's books. <laughs> yeah, children's books, nice idea. 3,000 bloodthirsty orcs descend on the village and raise them, <laughs> led by the undead lord from the underworld. Goblins eating the flesh. Great children's book. Sleep night. Sleep tonight, kids, yeah. Good night. <laughs> Don't look under your bed. <laughs> when someone tells you a dream, just accept it as it is. We, we've got, you've got absolutely nothing to gain by keeping their feet on the ground, keeping their head in reality. Just accept that dream. If someone tells you their dream, they're telling you to incorporate you into it, to bring it along, bring you along on the ride. So don't rip up their lottery ticket before their numbers even come up. Back in that guidance counselor's office, there was a barrier put up. Well, I'm happy to say that today, Jeff Easley is a friend of mine. At least I hope I can say that. We get together in Lake Geneva when we can have lunch, and he critiques my artwork. We trade notes on painting and get together at conventions, and we chat about what's going on. He's a real nice guy. I regularly work for Gygax. Luke Gygax puts on GaryCon every year. It's a convention that honors his father, Gary Gygax, the creator of Dungeons and & Dragons. And here he is signing some of my work that's been published and distributed around the planet. What about that mill? What about that mill that would always be there for me that I was destined to work at? That mill is sitting empty now. It's been empty for a long time. It's crumbling into the river that flows through Keyser Falls, Maine. With every rusty nail that sinks to the bottom of that river, sinks the thousand dreams of people that went before me. People that came along and fell into the gaps, created by themselves, created by others, who shrugged and said, well, I'll just get a job at the mill. That's what normal people do. Mind the gaps, yes, but please don't ever create one. Thank you.